there's lots of hope. Yeah, don't lose hope. That was a small midterm on a small course, so your semester's not over. Uh, okay, so reading quiz number seven covers engineering design method. That's chapter seven in the book, and that quiz is now open. Um, I wanted you to have some breathing room after you took the midterm exam, and so I know some of you were looking for it um, on Monday, but actually I, I just gave you a little bit of a break. So uh, your next reading quiz is open now. You can take that until Monday at noon, at which point it will close and then it'll switch over to the next reading quiz. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is the design project. It's a wind turbine design project related to some of the same ideas that we've covered already with the solar power cart. And in fact, we're going to continue talking about the solar powered cart next week. It's just I wanted to give you this project as early as I could so you can get started on it and so it doesn't seem too overwhelming at the end of the semester. Uh, what I'm going to be giving you today is not only the entire project description, but also uh, an assignment that sort of kicks things off for you, a first step assignment. And that first step assignment, which should be very easy, should only take you maybe 15 or uh, 30 minutes to complete, is due tomorrow by 4 o'clock. So you can submit it to my office. And, you know, that's during my office hours. Uh, you can submit it tomorrow by 4 o'clock. All right, so those are the announcements. Any questions about those? We'll talk a lot more about the design project today. Oops, wrong button. Okay, just to kick things off, I want to show you a couple of videos that illustrate wind turbines in the real world. I'm a C3 wind turbine today. We're going up over 200 feet. Wind turbine may sway because of the, the wind outside. You will be in the close proximity of high voltage cables, 34,500 volts. So we're set to go ahead and climb up the turbines. So there's a, a base section, a midsection, and a top section to each turbine. Alright, right now we're in the, uh, the yaw deck. This is where the nacelle is going to pivot. Gearbox weighs around 20 tons. The generator and air cooler uh, are just less than 10 tons. cool to me except for the last part where there's a guy hanging underneath. That'd be a little bit creepy, right? They, it seems like they take safety seriously there with all of the safety cables and even having to tie off as they're climbing the ladder up. But I think one of the things that that video makes pretty clear is just how enormous those towers are. If you see them on the top of a hill, it's hard to appreciate the scale of them. Um, but as it was saying at the beginning of that video, it's more than 30,000 volts that the wind turbines generate. And I think uh, some of the largest wind turbines that have been installed in the world 
are able to generate enough power to, uh, to feed the electrical demands for 5,000 homes. So that's pretty amazing if you think about it. Of course, what's the big drawback of wind power? You can't put them everywhere, right? You know, it's not windy in some places. And even in windy places, it's not always windy. So it produces power in a variable way. Uh, let's take a look at this other video. It's a little bit uh, wind power on a smaller scale. So what you can see here is that instead of being oriented uh, horizontally, here the shaft is oriented vertically. videos show that um, you know, wind turbines can be a pretty effective way of generating electricity because uh, once you produce the item, there's really very limited ongoing maintenance costs. There's very limited consumables. And uh, it's one of the renewable sources of energy that's really been growing a lot. And you can see uh, the turbines popping up all across the country. I think there's uh, some here in West Virginia as well, up on mountaintops places. Now, in the project that you're going to be doing, um, we're going to try and optimize the power generation of a design, where you can calculate the amount of power that a wind turbine can generate by voltage squared divided by resistance. So this formula, you can bet, is something that's very important. You're going to do a lot of calculations with this formula. Uh, in previous semesters, when I did have a final exam, I told students you're going to see this equation on the final exam for sure, but since you have a final project rather than a final exam, you don't have to worry about memorizing it. You're definitely going to use it a lot. Um, so look at that equation. And if you think about the way, if you're trying to maximize power, just the way that equations work is if you want P to be large, that means you can either have a big value in the numerator over here. You can have a high voltage or you can have a low resistance. Now, that's a little bit counterintuitive based on the name of that variable omega. They call it resistance. And what you'd maybe think is that a big numerical value for resistance is a lot of resistance because you know big numbers means a lot. But as I'll, I'll show you, we'll go take a quick look at the, uh, at the equipment if we get a chance. Um, if you have a low resistance value, what that means is actually it's akin to a, a small pipe that the electricity is able to flow through. Really what, what you're talking about is um, how large the conduit is that the power can travel through. And so if you have a very low resistance, then these values are going to spin very slowly. And we'll look at that. Uh, if we get a chance to go uh, take a quick look at the equipment. It's already set up in the lobby. Maybe some of you saw it in your way in. So some of the questions that you're going to explore is um, what's the best resistance setting to use in order to generate the most power? Like where's the perfect operational point? The, these big ones, they have computers on board that continually adjust the location of the blade, like what direction it's pointed in. You know, they can aim those blades and rotate them based on which direction the wind's coming from. And they have computerized controls that uh, adjust the pitch of the blade. You know, that it has a variable pitch so that they can rotate the blade itself as it's spinning. Uh, you won't have that aspect to deal with. But what you will be trying to do is maximize voltage by changing resistance setting. 
And I've got a box over there that allows you to dial in exactly the resistance setting that you want to test. And also, you can see that most of these big commercial operations have three blades, but they're also quite a bit bigger than the scale you're going to be working on. What you're going to need to test is what generates the most power, having two blades or three blades or four. It's called parametric design when you try lots of different combinations of things and uh, you pick out the optimum combination of variables. And you're, you're talking about engineering, you're reading about engineering design in the textbook uh, this coming week. And so this is an engineering design activity that uses what's called parametric optimization. You break the design down into pieces. Each piece represents some sort of a parameter that you're trying to get the best performance out of each one individually. For example, how long should these blades be? You know, if you have really long blades, then they're probably going to rotate more slowly because they'll be heavy and you'll have more mass away from the axis of rotation. But if they're long, then what that would mean is that maybe they can handle a heavier load so that when you turn the resistance value down to 5 ohms or 10 ohms, which would be considered uh, a heavy load, it's our stand-in for a heavy load, then it's going to spin slow, but still it can capture more of the air. So uh, the designs that I've set out right now, one of the blades, one of the sets of blades is relatively big and one of them is relatively small. What you're going to do in testing is you're going to build a prototype and you're going to see uh, is long, medium, or short generating more power. And then which is better, two, three, or four blades? And then you combine those two together to find out the best resistance setting. So here's an illustration of parametric design. This is some tests that I did, a little design that I threw together very quickly. And uh, the first thing I wanted to look at was what was the best resistance setting to use when I generate power with this little prototype that I made. And so I didn't know before I started which would be the best resistance setting. So I tested it at 30 ohms, 40 ohms, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 100 ohms. Because frankly, I didn't know which one would give me the best power. Now the voltage meter that I'm using, actually what you, the, the instrument that you'll be using, it only tells you the volts. So it may say, you know, that the voltage is 1.15 volts. And so what I had to do was I noticed in my, uh, I noticed that I dialed in a certain resistance setting. Let's say that I had the voltage was 1.15 volts and my resistance was uh, maybe 60 ohms. So what I would do to find the power, remember it's voltage squared divided by resistance. And so I could say 1.15 volts squared divided by 60 ohms. And does anybody have a calculator? I hope you all have calculators. You know, engineers are always supposed to carry calculators on their person. You never know when you'll need to crunch numbers. Now is one of those times. Let's get some practice using the power equation. Voltage squared divided by resistance. So what would be the power if this was the, the data that I was getting? 0 0.022. That seems high. Is that what it would be? You checked it? Okay, good. Well, that would be a very good scenario if I got uh, if I got that. So the units here are watts. All right. Sometimes because the numbers are so small, what we'll do is we'll talk about milliwatts instead of watts. And so how do you think you convert from watts into milliwatts? What do you figure the conversion factor is? Times a thousand, right. So one, two, three. That would be 22 milliwatts. Okay, so it's a, it's a simple calculation. So what you'll be doing during the project is you'll go through and you'll test the, uh, the number of volts that the energy transfer generator is uh, generating and you'll look at the resistance setting and you'll calculate what, how much power is being generated for each one of those resistance settings and for each of the different blade designs that you use. Uh, for each of the blade lengths, for, for the parameters that you optimize. Here's some data that was comparing the number of blades. 
what I did one year was I took all of the student, um, all of the student projects, and uh, some of them had two blades, some of them had three, and there was a lot of other differences. This, th this wasn't the only variable, but in general, I noticed this particular year that it seemed like the two blade designs were the ones that generated the most power for whatever reason. It could have been coincidence or it could be a trend. But that was the trend that I observed when I took the student's data one year. Uh, another trend I took was I looked at what's, what's better, a really big diameter. Um, and by diameter, what I mean is if you've got, you know, blades that are like this, then the diameter, if it traces a circle, then the diameter is this distance here, the diameter. So I measured the diameter of each of the students, and it seemed like the ones that were really big, you know, like enormous blades, they didn't fare so well. And there seemed to be a trend that the really small diameter blades also didn't great, but there was sort of a, uh, a peak around, you know, between 200 and maybe 350. These were, this was a good range to be in. And this is, this is a, an example of analyzing the data parametrically. I've broken down the design elements into parameters. You know, you can have number of blades vary. You can have the diameter vary. Uh, you can vary the resistance setting. And um, on the day of the final test, when you come in to show me how much power you can design, you can choose any resistance setting that you want. Um, and hopefully you've tested enough before class, before that day's class, that you know what the perfect operating condition is for your design. Because I'm, I'm looking to see that you can generate as much power as possible. And so some students had very, very low resistance settings and they weren't able to generate much power because those resistance settings were too low. Some people had resistance settings that were pretty high. It seemed like the resistance settings in the middle were the ones that did the best. So, Here's a look at some of the equipment we're going to be using for the project. It's just an ordinary box fan. The box fan has a high, medium, and low setting. And what you need to do is test your design at high, medium, and low. We want something that's good over a range of wind speeds. And on the day of testing, that's what I'm going to do, is I'm going to see how your design behaves at low, medium, and high, and I'm going to average the three. So we'll take a calculate the power it generates at medium, high, low, and then average the three. This is a look at the energy transfer generator. This is a very delicate piece of equipment, and I hope you'll uh, treat it carefully because um, it's, it's not that it's very expensive, it's just uh, really hard to get new ones. The company that we buy this from has a big backlog, and um, you know they're only, I think, about $70 or $80 a piece, but still you need to be careful with it. And especially, I'll, I'll mention one thing. So it's got a shaft uh, here. I think it's, well, you'll be able to go see it in a minute. You, you screw the, uh, the hub that your blades are, uh, are going to be held by onto this threaded shaft. And if you push too hard when you're screwing it on, then it will just pop the magnet out of where it's supposed to be housed. So just as you're screwing the hub on, as you're actually putting it on to the energy transfer generator, be very gentle. And if you push it through and it's broken, that's okay. Just let me know so I can fix it. I won't slap you around or call you names or anything. I'll be a little ir irritated, but I'll fix it and it'll be no harm done. Just let me know if you push that shaft out of its housing so I can fix it. All right, this is the... Uh, this is the box that we use to dial in the resistance. And so what you can see is that <clears throat> right now it is set at, let's just double check, okay, 201 is the resistance. No, that's no, 20. Okay, so 21. Here's the hundreds. So uh, you dial it to whatever, you can dial in whatever resistance setting you like. You know, if you wanted to do uh, 5,000 and 25, then here you could go to the thousands and you turn the thousands to five, you turn this to two and the ones to five, and it's cumulative. That's the resistance box. And then here is the instrument, the voltage meter that you'll be using to measure the voltage. Now, here's two really important pieces of information. If you're taking notes today, 
you definitely need to take note of when you first turn it on, it'll be in the off position. You turn it to V to measure voltage. And then you need to push the select button. Because when it first turns on, it's expecting that you're going to test a direct current. But these generators are alternating current. So if you leave it in DC, all of your data will be worthless. And you'll get a very poor grade on the assignment. But if you push the select button and it goes to AC, then everything's good. Because it's an alternating current that the that energy transfer generator gives off an alternating current. So please, please, please don't do all of your testing on direct current. And the data will be gibberish, by the way. It, it won't make any sense at all. There won't be any viable trends you'll be able to discern if you leave it in direct current. But uh, be sure and put, when you turn it on, turn it to V and then push the select button. All right? It'll say DC instead. If it says DC, change it to AC. All right. Here's a look at some of the designs that students in past semesters have done. So, and you can actually see some of these students uh, around the engineering building. And here was an idea of uh, using, looks like, two liter bottles to try and capture the wind. You know, it was going to rotate this direction. These guys ended up with a four-bladed design. And you'll notice, by the way, that their hub, it, they had like sort of a wooden dowel. Since then, um, I've had these special aluminum hubs custom machined for students to use so that your assignment's easier and you can focus on the important things. Students had a lot of trouble making the connection to this uh, energy transfer generator shaft. It was really hard because it's threaded with M3 threads, which is kind of an unusual threading pattern. It was hard to get the equipment needed to get onto there. And so rather than waste students' time trying to make that connection, I had these machined, and I'm going to let you borrow them. But you have to check them out. These are very, very precious, expensive, custom-made hubs. But I'm going to let you use them, and hope you'll take good care of them. So let's take a look at some of the designs. Here's a four blade design. It didn't generate much power though. Look at that. 0.8 milliwatts. I think they were a little bit disappointed when they saw how much power was generated by some of their classmates. Here's an interesting design using metal. 2.9 milliwatts for a six blade design. Cardboard. Nice and light. Another metal design. You can get a, a close-up idea of what they used to have to do to make that connection to the shaft. Pinwheel. This one was relatively large and heavy, but it was sturdy. It was really well balanced. Sometimes the students who do really well have a well balanced where it's not like, you know, when it's out of balance it'll rotate kind of jerky, but if it's well balanced then it rotates smooth and it can get going faster generates more power. And here's the guy who actually made the, uh, he, he came up with the idea for these hubs. He made his own in his own metal shop and I was so blown away by the work that he did I asked him if he'd be able to make more so the rest of the students could benefit. So if you see Morgan out in the, out in the lobby, tell him thanks because he saved you a lot of work by making these hubs. You can see that it's dark outside. A lot of students do their testing in the evenings. This is, uh, the equipment's going to be out in the lobby. And the engineering building has students in it late into the evening. And so you can come over here and do the testing in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Whenever you and your partners would like to get together to use the equipment is fine. You can see some students put in less effort than others playing cards. Twenty two milliwatts. So right now we're ten ten times higher than some of the early designs. Mine did forty three milliwatts, but uh, the winner was actually this one. I think this design did 
about 60 milliwatts on average. It was a really good design. All right, but uh, yours will actually most likely do less because the, the, the hub is a little bit heavier. So they had a nice light hub. Yours is heavier. So um, I have comparisons from the years since we have started using the hubs, and you'll be able to see that. Uh, let me hand out the project description and the getting started assignment, and then you can come with me down the hall and we'll take a quick look at the equipment. extra copy of the project? All right. The project lets you know what you need to do for testing. And in fact, I've provided some data sheets that you can record your test data onto. You're going to get two separate grades for this project. One is for doing the project and for the result of having a prototype to test and uh, bringing your design to test on the, the last day of class. And the other half of the project grade is for a report. And I explain on the second page what elements are required in the report. It has to have brainstorming notes, photographs of your design along the way to show me you know, what some of your early prototypes look like compared to the final product, showing me what your design looked like with the short blades, medium blades, long blades. Uh, the report needs to have data tables and a graph a description of how you changed your design over time, a log of meeting times, a summary of who did what. I want to be very careful to avoid the case where, you know, there's three people in a group and two people do all the work and one person does nothing. So I want to have a detailed description of how each group member contributed to the end result in the report that you submit. And then uh, as the appendix, I'd like to have the original data sheets that you filled out. So, you know, this form, with the original um, data that you collected while you were doing your testing. So read this more carefully. We don't have the time to go through it word for word right now. But for this project, what you're going to be doing is you're going to work in pairs or in groups of three. Um, we don't have enough of the hubs for you to work individually. But you work in groups of two or three students. And uh, what you need to have by tomorrow, if you look at the second paper that I gave you, you need to know who is your group going to be. So it can be two or three people. Write the names very clearly on the team sign-up part. Uh, the second thing is you need to decide if you want to check out the hub. It's not mandatory to use it, but it will sure make things a lot easier. If you're not willing to take on the responsibility of the hub or if you'd rather use something else, that's fine too. Uh, but for people who do use the hub, I want you to sign it out and agree to pay $100 if you don't return it in the same condition that you got it. So if it's broken, like if the threads are stripped, or if you lose it, then it would be $100 to have it um, manufactured again. These were custom machined. So uh, The last thing is I'd like a very rough work plan, meaning an outline of what you're going to do and when. So you need to get together as a team, go over your schedule and find out when do you have time to build the prototype, when do you have time to have a brainstorming session, when are you going to do the testing. You know, schedule that amongst yourselves so that you avoid the situation of the weekend before this is due, everyone trying to get into the engineering building and testing it and wishing the building was unlocked on Sunday night so you could do all the work. That's, that's just... Uh, that's not going to be feasible because there are too many people who are going to want to use too few machines. And so you're going to have to do your testing as early as possible or you'll be standing in line waiting your turn to have access to the equipment. Because there's this class and a whole other class that's going to be wanting to use the two test stations that we've got. Any questions about the project or this assignment that's due tomorrow by 4 o'clock? Any questions at all? 
You can choose amongst yourselves, yeah. Two or three people can work together on the project. All right. Um, while I shut down the computer, why don't you talk amongst yourselves, try and get into groups right now, and then we'll walk down the hall and look at the equipment. No, at the top it says only one form is required for each group. <laughs>